How are you doing everybody? It's Mike Webb coming at you again with another video. I mentioned in a couple of my previous videos that I did some avionics upgrades in my 1980 Piper Archer 2 and I decided today it'd be a great idea to go ahead and detail those changes that I made. I'm going to talk about my decision process when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to add to the panel and why. I'm hoping that you'll find this interesting today and if you do, of course, smash that like button as the kids say these days. And if you're considering doing a panel upgrade yourself, I'm hoping that this video you'll find informative because when I was trying to decide what components to put into my airplane for this upgrade, I didn't find a ton of useful information out there, and so I'm hoping that this may actually help some of you guys as well. Now, overall, I was leaning towards putting Garmin components into the panel because I'm very familiar with the products that Garmin makes, and I felt that, generally speaking, the resale value might hold up a little better in case I decide to sell down the road. So with that said, here are the details about what I did in my avionics panel upgrade. So from the beginning, I wanted to buy a plane for my leaseback operation that didn't need a lot of work. I found a 1980 Piper Archer II and it had all original components in it with the exception of a panel mounted GPS that was the Garmin GTN 650. Now this was a big factor in my purchase because I knew that whatever plane I got to use for my personal training and on the leaseback with the flight school had to have at least a decent GPS in it. All of them had at least a Garmin 430 in it or better. Some was, some not. Now, the GTN 650 series of navigators, part of the GTN family, was actually uh, the next generation of GPSs after the GNS 430 and 530, but I didn't think of that as a bad thing. If anything, it was a bonus, even if I had to get over a bit of a learning curve. So unless you were renting a plane with a G1000 in it, which I had done for many hours and actually really liked, I felt like this was a, a pretty sophisticated GPS to start with. Beside the point, I wasn't interested in investing in my first airplane on a leaseback operation to be a full glass panel anyway. So when I found this airplane, I realized there was really nothing I was going to need to do to it other than comply with the ADSB mandate that was coming up in January of 2020. So in other words, this airplane was pretty turnkey and ready to go. And this was essentially the case for the first few months that I had it on the line at the flight school. However, I noticed that when I was flying it for some of my personal training from time to time, that the attitude indicator would start to act up. Like it would roll out of sync for a few seconds and sort of show a bank and then come back to the center. And then even on a few flights, it would completely just go like 30 degrees out of bank uh, even when I was flying wings level, and it would stay there for several minutes until either landing or just on its own, it would decide to sort of uh, get back into its uh, correct state of mind. Now, fortunately, every time it did this, this mal malfunction, essentially, especially for more than a couple of seconds, it was always in VMC conditions, so there was really no imminent safety threat per se. But you can imagine how if this happened in instrument conditions, how it would really put mine or any uh, pilot's instrument skills to work. Now, as to why this would happen, that the attitude indicator would, would sort of uh, start to act up, is it could be several things. Problems with the vacuum system, problems with the pump, or maybe even just the instrument in general. And if it was the instrument specifically, it was a good indication that that instrument was going to need overhaul or replacement very soon. Now, relatedly, the directional gyro or DG wasn't suffering from any of these uh, side effects. And so together with uh, the AMPs at my school, and the IA, we determined that this was probably specific to the instrument itself and not the vacuum system overall. So I looked at overhaul options and even replacement options. And the general consensus is that it's going to be at least uh, $400 to overhaul the instrument as much as several hundred dollars to even a thousand dollars to replace it altogether. That's a lot of money to invest in a nearly 40 year old instrument. And right around that same time, I learned about the Garmin G5 instruments that had recently become certified, specifically also for the PA28. And most of you out there probably already know about the Garmin G5. It's basically a small PFD that fits in the same spot as the old attitude indicator. And it depicts the artificial horizon just as the old instrument does. But it also displays much more information like altitude and airspeed tapes, vertical speed indications, heading information, and even turn and bank coordinated turn information. You can also adjust the altimeter setting with a Colesman window just like you could in the old instrument. It's essentially a mini-sized version of what you'd find in a primary flight display or PFD from any of the major manufacturers in the glass cockpit. Now, I had over 100 hours of flight time behind the G1000 at that point, so I was well aware of the advantages of having those types of information on one display, and also I was familiar with interpreting it 
with the tapes versus the round dial format, albeit this is a much smaller version. So I pretty quickly decided that I would rather put in a new G5 instrument in the same spot where the old instrument was, rather than overhaul it or replace it. Was it more expensive to put in a new G5? Of course, but I figured the added value it would provide to the panel was worth it. Between the extra capabilities and the wow factor that it would give to the panel, I decided that it was well worth the cost. And I really didn't even think twice. So now here's where the fun part starts. I'd heard that if I had two G5 instruments installed in what they call a dual G5 installation, that I could potentially remove the entire vacuum system altogether. Maintaining the vacuum system in a 40-year-old airplane it can be pretty expensive and uh, maintenance intensive. And I was pretty sure that this instrument was not the only one that was gonna need attention in the short term future. Now, the vacuum system removal is possible because in a dual G5 installation, one of the G5s replaces the attitude indicator and the other one replaces the directional gyro. Now, much like the G5 that replaces the attitude indicator, the one that goes in the DG spot is quite the serious upgrade. The second G5 is essentially an, an electronic horizontal situation indicator, or HSI, which is a considerable gain in functionality from the basic directional gyro with a heading bug. Among other things, it can revert to the PFD if the one above it actually fails in any situation. This creates a level of redundancy along with the fact that each instrument has its own backup battery if the ship were to lose power. Since both are electronic instruments, the vacuum system can go altogether. And I didn't have any other vacuum driven equipment on the airplane like de-icing boots to be concerned with. Now an exception to this would be if I had an autopilot that ran off of the old attitude indicator, which I did. But when you're installing a dual G5 setup from Garmin, they have adapters like the GAD 29B where although it might be a little bit clumsy, you can actually keep the older legacy autopilots and still have them get some heading information and drive them off of the G5s. Is it clunky? Yes. Is it doable? Yes. So I had to put some serious thought into whether I was going to do just one G5 or go ahead and do both for the dual setup. But we'll get to that a little bit later. Now, as I said earlier, everything in the airplane was original from 1980 with the exception of the Garmin GTN 650. That included the audio panel, which was really starting to show its age compared to more modern digital panels, and the transponder, which at minimum was going to be needing replacement so that I could meet the ADS-B mandate. So I started shopping around for quotes to upgrade the transponder to meet the ADS-B mandate and to potentially do one G5 or maybe even both if you've ever looked into doing avionics upgrades on a plane and you've talked to owners and avionics shops, one of the biggest responses you'll get from all of them, regardless of where they're coming from, is if you're gonna get into the panel to do uh, one thing, you might as well tackle several things while you're already back there. Because it takes a lot of time and labor to get behind the panel and access all of those instruments and all of their wiring. The point being that the labor is really quite extensive and so you might as well avoid having to pay for it again later. So I was fortunate enough to be in a position where I actually could consider whether I wanted to spend the money to do some more things while I was there. But this is also where the term project creep really can come into play. Because there are so many great things you can do today to take a panel that was created decades ago and really bring it into the 21st century if you really do desire to do so. And you can spend an awful lot of money doing that. So long story short, I decided to go with the dual G5 setup so I could remove the potentially costly to maintain vacuum system, all while adding the vastly superior capabilities and redundancy of the electronic screens. I felt that this would be a great compromise between the old tried and true six pack steam gauge cockpit panel and the newer generation full glass cockpits. Now, speaking of glass cockpits, another feature I really enjoyed about the G1000 was the real-time fuel flow and engine parameters information. The analog fuel gauges and aircraft like mine from decades and decades ago are notoriously inaccurate and actually by law are only required to be accurate for one reading when the airplane is empty. That doesn't inspire a lot of confidence. Even if you master the concept and practice of estimated fuel burn settings from knowing your power settings, and the duration of flight. It's a great basic skill to have, let's be honest, but it really pales in comparison to the accuracy of these modern engine monitors that display with any power change or mixture adjustment, the real-time fuel flow, endurance, fuel required to your destination, etc. So I started to explore ways I could make as many upgrades as possible within my budget. I was actually fortunate enough to get some credit from my installer on some of the components that were currently in the panel, and that opened up some doors for me. I decided to add the JPI EDM830 engine monitor. This gave me real-time fuel flow like I was just referring to 
with the exact fuel burn because of fuel transducers that are calibrated properly with the K-factor involved and allowed me to actually monitor real CHTs and EGTs for my cylinders, which to that point, I didn't have that capability built into the panel. This decision alone was a major upgrade to the utility of flying and the ease of actually staying aware of my engine's health. I also decided to add the Garmin GMA 350C audio panel, which enabled Bluetooth streaming of music to all the occupants in the airplane, 3D audio, and the intelligence feature which is pretty useful actually from time to time. I added the Garmin GTR225 as a secondary comm, and it actually replaced my existing second nav comm source. I decided to go with a secondary comm only and not a nav comm, and the money I saved there helped me with some of the other ideas I had for the panel. Specifically, when I was looking at the transponder upgrade, I had some initial ideas about how I was gonna cross that hurdle, but I decided with the savings from the other decisions I made, to go ahead and put in the Garmin GTX 345. While it's definitely not the cheapest solution, the GTX 345 provides ADS-B out and in, which gives me traffic and weather on the GTN 650 and on a portable device like my iPad, without having to set up uh, the use of a Stratus or some sort of portable ADS-B receiver. Another thing I decided to add was the Garmin Flightstream 510. If you haven't heard of it, it's essentially a card that replaces the standard SD card that you use to update databases in your panel mounted GPS. It's blue in color and has Bluetooth and Wi-Fi built into it. This enables Garmin's database concierge, where instead of removing the cards, taking them home, sticking them into a computer or a card reader, updating the databases there, then returning the card to the, to the GPS, inserting the card and uploading them there. Instead, I can show up with my iPad, where I've downloaded the databases at home overnight, show up to the airplane, flip a switch, and with a push of a button, I can transfer those database updates over the air in a matter of seconds. This is really so much nicer and convenient than the old-fashioned way, and believe me, I've done both, so I know what I'm talking about. Also, with the 510, you can sync flight plans from your mobile device to your panel-mounted GPS, and vice versa. This is nice when your flight plan that you've developed at home involves a convoluted route of many waypoints that would be really a bear to manually enter one by one into your GPS in the airplane. Or when ATC edits your route on flight, you can make a change on the panel or on your mobile device, and with a simple push of a button, you can confirm the swap between the two. And now finally, I mentioned earlier that I had to sort of decide whether to remove the vacuum system or not for the dual G5s, being that one thing I needed to consider is how would it affect my current autopilot setup? Well, after much deliberation, I decided to ditch the entire vacuum system altogether, and instead of trying to figure out the workaround with the legacy autopilot, I decided to just go ahead and replace the autopilot altogether. Now it helped that I received some credit from my existing uh, autopilot components, but in the end I decided to install the newly certified at the time GFC 500 for my Piper Archer. Now, once again, my experience in the G1000 really informed my decision-making process when I was looking at this autopilot. And that's because in the G1000, I had over 100 hours behind it with the integrated GFC 700 autopilot on many cross-country trips where I was able to experience firsthand how excellent that autopilot is from altitude capture to following a, a GPS waypoint, etc. It's really a fantastic autopilot altogether. And basically, having experienced that and then using the autopilot that came in the Archer, I really could tell the difference between analog and the new digital autopilots and their capabilities. The GFC 500 was touted to have all the bells and whistles of the GFC 700, but including some newer features that even the GFC 700 didn't have, like Garmin's ESP, which protects against overspeeding and underspeeding conditions, and even the blue level button, so that no matter what happens, if you just push one button, the airplane will fly straight and level. So after the fact, let me tell you, this was absolutely worth the cost. Many of you who may be out there and have looked at the GFC 500 autopilot you may be thinking the same question. Did I decide to go ahead and get the optional trim servo as well? Well, the answer is yes. I hemmed and haw about this one for a while. I mean, it really isn't that hard to manually trim the airplane when it's on autopilot, especially since the G5s actually provide a prompt for you to say trim up or trim down. But it really is so nice to have the plane just do all the work for you like it did in the GFC 700 that I was used to. And the fact is, it's a relatively small fraction of the cost to add that option. So as you can see, 
What started as a, I have to upgrade my transponder for the ADSB mandate and maybe add a single G5 project, really turned into quite a transformative overhaul of my panel. Now as for what was removed in the job, the entire vacuum system, a slew of King products, including the KMA20 audio panel, the KX170B Navcom, CDI, ADF system, Glide Slope, DME, the KT76 transponder, as well as the Garmin GI106 CDI, the STEC PSS60 system, both of which I actually received credit for, as I mentioned before, the original Piper Autopilot, both of the existing AI and DG gyro instruments, and the turn and bank indicator. With all the associated plumbing, wiring, and accessories, I gained over 60 pounds of useful load when this job was done. That in itself can be considered a pretty substantial increase in value for the airplane, and that's before you even factor in the increase in avionics capabilities. When all was said and done, this turned out to be a much bigger project than I originally intended to do, but I kept thinking about how much I would really enjoy flying the airplane if I made these changes, and how much more appealing I felt that the renters and students would find it in the flight school because it was indeed going to be going on leaseback. Well, I can certainly attest to the first part that it is very true. I've taken my family on several trips in it in all kinds of weather, and the GFC 500 autopilot is solid as a rock. It will fly approaches down to LPV minimums, and I've done so. It really is a fantastic autopilot. The JPI 830 has helped me uncover some problems with a few of my cylinders that I would not have known about had I not installed that engine monitor. And now I keep a close eye on them to make sure they stay within all the parameters that I want to keep them nice and healthy. And with the improved fuel flow data I have, I never have to worry whether my math is right or those inaccurate fuel gauges are reading properly. Now additionally, I've gotten nothing but incredible feedback from all the instructors I know at the school and many of the renters that I've gotten to know as well. They say that all of the above is the same for them too. They really appreciate the added capabilities. They love especially the G5s because it's the perfect hybrid between steam gauge six pack basic training skills to the full glass cockpit of a DA40 or Cirrus, something like that. And now it even turned out to be more beneficial than I ever even imagined. Soon after I had all of these changes done, the FAA changed the rules on the required aeronautical experience for commercial pilot applicants. Until then, you needed a minimum of 10 hours in a complex aircraft, and most, if not all, check rides for commercial airplane applicants were conducted in a complex aircraft. However, the FAA conceded with this rule change that many flight schools found maintaining these aging airframes with retractable gear, whether it was one, two, or however many they had, proving very difficult as they got older. That, and in keeping with the trend of modern avionics, the FAA changed the rules to state that in lieu of those 10 hours in a complex aircraft, the applicant could have 10 hours in a technologically advanced aircraft or TAA. To qualify as a TAA, this means the plane must have a PFD, a moving map GPS that displays MFD-like data, and a two-axis autopilot. With the dual G5 setup, the GTN 650, and now the GFC 500, my Archer was now considered a technologically advanced aircraft and meant that it could take a pilot all the way from their private license, through instrument training, and all the way to their commercial license as well, all in the same plane. So I'm happy to report that more than one pilot actually has followed this career path where they got everything from their PPL all the way up to their commercial license in the same plane. Also, I immediately benefited from the rule change as I conducted my commercial training and the check ride in my own Archer. So in my mind, even though it was really expensive, relatively speaking, I felt that the job was completely worth it. The plane has increased in value, although as we all who look into these things know, the odds that I'm gonna get my investment back if I ever decide to sell the plane are next to zero, I know. But just as importantly, I enjoy the upgrades and the increased capabilities they provide immensely. And I take pride in how capable the airplane is now and how well set up the panel really is. Finally, there is no question that the upgrades that I made to this aircraft have absolutely helped the bottom line in terms of my leaseback business. I said it in my other videos and I'll say it again here. The costs of doing these upgrades have been repaid for easily by the increase in hours and activity in the flight school. Would I be farther in the black if I hadn't done these panel upgrades? Probably. Would it be as popular with students and renters and therefore fly as much if I hadn't done all of these upgrades? Most definitely not. But above all else, I love the changes that were made. It was my first plane, and although I liked it just the way it was when I bought it, I have now made it mine. That could be considered priceless. So what do you guys think? If you liked this video and found it helpful or informative, smash that like button, again as the kids say these days, 
And if you want to follow more of what I'm doing, please subscribe and hit the notification bell. And of course, YouTube will let you know the second I release a new video for you. I've got many more ideas that are working right now, and I'm super excited about bringing more and more content to you guys. One of my ideas is to actually go up in the airplane and actually take some videos of a lot of these avionics I've talked about in use so you can see how they apply in the real world. So I'll see you next time. But until then, as always, don't fly too low or too slow.